Without further ado, let me briefly tell you what we expect for the rest of the day here today. Immediately, we have the thematic sessions. We have an overview of the Indian agriculture sector by the chairman of Sri Nirko Sugars Limited, Sri Atul Chaturvedi. Following that, Mr. G. Chandrasekhar, who, as you all know, is a very eminent agribusiness specialist, will be speaking to us about the overview of the pulse scenario in India and a policy perspective of the pulses sector and overview by the former Secretary, Agriculture Ministry, Government of India, Mr. Siraj Hussain, who's with us already. This will be followed by Ms. Anuparna Shankar, who is the lead for agriculture sector at Invest India, who will give us a pretty brief presentation of approximately 10 minutes. Then we start with the panels. The first panel at this pulses conclave 2023 is the Global Pigeon Peas Outlook Panel which will be moderated by Global Pulses expert, Mr. Lalit Bangar. The panelists include the president of OATA Myanmar, Mr. Shamdar Sarya. From Bajrang International Group, we have Jayesh Patel. And from Dalal Satish Upadhyaya, we have Satish Upadhyaya. Post which, we'll have a very curtailed lunch break because we're already half an hour behind schedule, but it's going to be an incredible, interesting lunch. Post-lunch, we have the Global Lentil Outlook Panel Discussion, moderated by Mr. Rav Kapoor of ETG Canada. Opportunities in the Indian agri and food se inf sector infrastructure will be following that. And then post that is Pulses, Miling, Pulses Milling Dal Mill Modernization by Mr. Parag Gadre of ETG India, who's already in the hall with us. Importance of ESG and sustainable sourcing framework for Indian exporters, that's around 3 o'clock this afternoon. That will be taken by Mr. Gopinath Konati of KPMG. Moving on to the overview of minor pulses in India. From the Indian Institute of Pulses Research, we have Aditya Pratap. The next tea break of the day will be sponsored by Shenge Brothers LLP. And after that tea break, we have the Global Pulses Outlook 2023 from the Indian perspective by Mr. Manik Gupta of Etera. Agriculture and Pulses Trade in the Black Sea by Mr. Jonathan Grange of Sunstone Brokers, and that's around 4 o'clock in the evening. That and much more we have on a packed program today. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it's time to start off with the WhatsApp next. We'd like to thank RE International for that wonderful tea break that we've had. And I'd like to request you all to please remain seated and while you're in the hall, please ensure mobiles and connected devices are on silent. We shall continue. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I think, yes, it's time to start. Yeah, all right. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, to talk to us and give us his views of the overview of the Indian agriculture sector is a gentleman whom we know very well. He brings a wealth of experience here. We don't need to introduce him uh, because everyone knows him so very well and he's been a major supporter of the pulses industry. Ladies and gentlemen, to start off post tea, please welcome the chairman, Sri Renuka Sugars Limited, Sri Atul Chaturvedi to the days. Uh, is there anybody in the hall? Can we have some applause, please? Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And we've been meeting Eric after a long time. <laughs> Good morning, friends. And no dignitaries on the dais. Thank you, Vimalji, for inviting me to share my views with this August gathering. When the invitation to speak came, I was a bit worried whether the organizers would want me to speak on pulses. I definitely have some experience of handling pulses in the past, but in the last 10 years or about a decade, I have not been handling pulses. And the pulses scenario in the in our country has undergone a massive change. I believe the organization, organizers understood my dilemma and asked me to speak on agriculture. Before I begin, let me confess I am no expert on agriculture 
And the only experience I have is of dealing in wide range of agri-commodities over the last four decades. I've been associated with this sector in the country. With India doing wonderfully well in many sectors, like services, manufacturing, and their share in the GDP of our country rising big time. Agri, apparently, and the emphasis is on the word apparently, apparently looks to be a laggard. Analysts and commentators leave no stone unturned in criticizing the so-called Hindu rate of growth <coughs> in our agriculture. Some of the comments can be summarized as follows. Agri contribution to our GDP is currently in the range of about 17 to 18%. And many who were present in the 70s would recall that the contribution of Agri to our GDP those days used to be closer to about 40%. Our yields are woefully low in comparison to the world. For example, we continue to harvest roughly about one ton of soya beans per hectare, where the world average may be much higher than three tons per hectare. Soya bean itself occupies something like 12 million hectares of land, and India continues to produce only about 10 million tons. With arable land limited, I think something needs to be done in this sector. Technological intervention in our agriculture is relatively minuscule, though it's improving. We continue to oppose GM or genetically modified in our agriculture, which can be a game changer, as we have seen the changes as far as cotton in our country is concerned. Activists and NGOs hold the decision makers to ransom as we are currently seeing in the case of mustard, where the GEAC, the body which is actually uh, authorized to give the clearances, has already given the clearances, but it has still not seen the light of the day. So this is where the activists come into play and probably are stymieing the growth of our agriculture. Our agriculture is highly skewed in favor of wheat and rice, we continue to produce wheat and rice much in excess of our requirement and straining our storage resources. Farm sizes continue to be small. Too many persons are engaged in agriculture. And farm size continues to shrink with the passage of time. When the father dies, then his sons, then the land gets divided among the sons, and so on and so forth. What intervention can be done on a kitchen-sized farmland? Good quality seeds are not used. Farmers generally use their own produced seeds, which may have implications in germination. <laughs> Friends, this is the dark side of the so-called commentary on the dark side of Indian agriculture, but the scenario is actually not as bad as it is being projected. Friends, I have been closely tracking Indian agricultural scene for more than four decades. The situation is not as bad as our analysts and commentators would make us believe. We have certainly come a long way, and the sector has actually performed wonderfully well over the years. No doubt, agriculture in the 70s was contributing 40% to our GDP. But at that point of time, the country's GDP was minuscule, it was very small. Now, the GDP has expanded, and now we are close to about $3 trillion worth of GDP. Though the contribution of agri may have shrunk to about 17, 18%, but in absolute terms, the contribution of agriculture to our GDP has grown phenomenally over the years. And this will get reflected when we compare what was the scenario way back in 1950 and how much of water has flown below the Ganga Bridge over the years. Some of the criticism we hear about Indian agriculture 
may not be true, but it does not give a, may be true, but it does not give a true and fair picture, and it would not be out of place to compare the trajectory of growth between 1950 and 2022. Hopefully, this will help us in better understanding the success and failures of our agriculture over the years. In 1950, the net sown area in the country was 131 million hectares, which in 2022 is now about 140 million hectares. So the growth as far as the acreage or arable land in the country is concerned is only about 7%. It is important to understand that so the growth in land available for agriculture is still only very small. Food grain production, which was 51 million tons, has now grown to close to about 325 million tons. Our generation remembers the ship to fork, and we belong to that generation. Our generation remembers the ship to fork existence, which is no longer the case. The growth in this is close to about 520 percent. Fruits and vegetable production in our country has actually skyrocketed from roughly only about 25 million tons to more than 340 million tons. This has been one of the big success stories of modern agriculture in India. And the growth, I'm told, is close to about 1270 percent compared to the base year of, two of 1950. Milk production, which was merely 17 million tons in 1950, is now more than 210 million tons. Egg production has grown from 1.8 billion to 122 billion. Humongous increase. Honey production, same scenario. 700 ton is now about 1.3 million tons. Spices production has gone up. Sugarcane production, the industry which I come from, there again, now we are producing something like close to about 41 million tons in terms of sucrose production in the country. The cane production in the country has also skyrocketed and it's now close to about 465 to 470 million tons. Oil seed production, though a laggard, at, but has also grown from 5 million tons to close to about <coughs> 38 million tons currently. India's agricultural GVA, which was less than 10 billion in 1950, is now more than 532 billion. Growth of roughly 5,220%. It's a humongous increase. The most interesting take away from these figures is that even though the sown area has hardly gone up, our growth in all fields has been wonderful. Full credit needs to be given to our farmers and policymakers, and some of them are sitting here in this very room. Some more interesting facts about the Indian agriculture. In terms of value of agricultural output, India is double than that of USA and EU. Our agricultural output in value terms is much higher than that of USA and EU. During the recent supply chain disruption due to the Ukraine-Russia conflict, Indian wheat and rice exports actually helped many nations in ensuring that they do not have a food crisis in their backyard. Indian agriculture is no longer a gamble on monsoons, and famines are only part of the folklore. Now, we do not hear of India suffering from famine. This is the new India. India is the largest exporter of rice in the world, and we contribute almost 50% of the world trade as far as rice is concerned. Indian Agri exports this year have touched the magical figure of 50 billion US. This is a huge achievement. Friends, India is one of the major players in the agriculture sector worldwide, 
and it is the primary source of livelihood for almost 58% of our population. So its importance cannot be negated or reduced. India has the largest cattle herd, largest producer of milk, pulses, and spices in the world. India is the second largest producer of fruits, vegetables, tea, farmed fish, cotton, sugarcane, wheat, rice, cotton, and sugar, and the list goes on. But there are some policy interventions which are required to make India a real powerhouse as far as agriculture is concerned or agricultural sector is concerned. Without doubt, Indian agriculture has come a long way since independence. However, we should not rest on our laurels and strive to achieve the standards of agri powerhouses like USA and Canada. Some course correction in terms of policy interventions may not be out of place. Friends, there is no point in flogging wheat and rice production beyond what is required for the country as its strains are not only the storage resources but also adds humongously to our food subsidy bill because we preserve and we procure in when the crop is harvested and then carry it for two, three years, putting a big strain on our storage resources as well as on our finances and our food subsidy bill is skyrocketing. What we are suggesting is incentivize Punjab and Haryana farmers to divert part of their land to oil seed and pulses. That could be a game-changing intervention. And if Punjab takes seriously to these crops, I'm sure the self-sufficiency as far as India is concerned would absolutely be no problems whatsoever. Oilseed cultivation definitely needs priority. We've been talking about National Mission on Oilseeds and Malhotra Saab sitting here and we all have worked together very closely on that. But as luck would have it, it has still not seen the light of the day. Only difference is that whatever intervention the Agriculture Ministry did, and it was helped by very high international prices of oils, our mustard production is skyrocketing, and it, which used to be about 75 to 80 lakh tons, is probably now being talked about at 125 lakh. So this has been a big, major achievement. And with a little more of thrust, I think India's self-sufficient edible oil would also come down, or would also improve, rather. Another thing which we've been talking and telling all the policy makers is that it's important to re redefine food security. For far too long, for the policy makers, food security meant wheat and rice security. As somebody said in the morning, I think the agriculture commissioner, roti, dal, and kapla, whatever. So, bagayar dal ke, your food security will not work. Kyunki gehu akele se, ya chawal akele se, you cannot make your food. You need oil as well, you need pulses as well. So, I think it's high time that we redefine what food security is, because then it will help the policy makers to give the right kind of thrust to these sectors. Technological intervention, including GM, needs to be implemented. For far too long, we have discussed, debated, till the cows came home. Nothing seems to have been done. Our agency, which is tasked with giving the clearances, like GEAC, has cleared mustard for GM intervention, but I'm afraid it has still not seen the light of the day. Somebody goes to Supreme Court and the issue gets into the back burners. So I think we need to give it the right kind of thrust. So Indian agriculture can do wonders if you're able to introduce technology into it. And why confine ourselves and uh, deprive ourselves of uh, GM? We've all been eating GM food over the years, and I don't think we all seem to be hell and hearty, absolutely no problems. 
we've been eating cotton oil, we've been eating genetically modified soy oil coming into the country for ages. So there's just no reason why we should continue to oppose it. Land aggregation is again a big problem because what intervention or big ticket investments can you encourage in agriculture when the size of the farm is like a kitchen garden? This is where we feel the policy of whether it's cooperation, but more particularly, we could have a system where the farmers could lease the land to a big aggregator, probably who has the wherewithal and the money to invest in agriculture. So once you aggregate land, we just need to ensure that the farmer is able to get more money than what he is currently earning. And the uh, aggregator would also require farmhands. So the same farmer can also be employed on the same land. So you have doubling of the farmer's income, and probably it will bring investments into the agriculture sector, which could be a big game changer as far as a country is concerned. But you need strong political will to put it down the throat of our nation. Friends, I think I bored you enough with all those statistics. And thank you, thank you very much for the patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That was the chairman, Sri Srinivas. Sir, may I please request you to stay on stage for a brief moment. Mr. Chaturvedi. Uh, may I please request Mr. Sunil Sabla, who is uh, one of the members of the a director with IPG to please step up on stage and present Mr. Atul Chaturvedi with a memento. Thank you, sir, for being with us here. Mr. Atul Chaturvedi brings, of course, the days, you know, four decades experience of uh, sort of multi-portal, multi-vertical experience. Hands-on experience in the various verticals in trading and agri-infrastructure. He's been much fated, many awards, and of course you hear him across all the media, responding and sharing of his uh, experiences and his views and vision. He's of course currently the president of the Solvent Extractor Association, amongst the many hats that he wears. Thank you once again, Mr. Chaturvedi, for being with us here, making it so very special. Up next also is a gentleman who will be talking to us about the overview of the Pulse scenario. Uh, from the Polis Peace perspective, it's the Indian Pulse scenario, and he's a gentleman who also brings a great wealth of experience, first of all, being in policy himself. He is a former secretary of the Agriculture Ministry, Government of India. He was the former managing director of Food Corporation of India, and a trustee now he is with the World Food Program Trust for India. He's also an independent director with Sri Renuka Sugars. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sri Siraj Hussain, former secretary, Agriculture Ministry, Government of India, to give us an overview on the policy perspective on the Indian policy sector, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. In fact, uh, a number of things which I wanted to say have already been said, so I will not be repeating that. In any case, uh, the speech which I am going to deliver today will be available on an online portal, The Wire, uh, either late evening today or maybe by tomorrow morning. So we know that um, only about one third of Indians are purely vegetarians. And according to the National Family Health Survey 5, conducted in 1921, only 16.6% .6 of men said that they never take non-vegetarian food. But having said this, as our agriculture commissioner said in the morning, even the non-vegetarians are mostly vegetarians on most days of the week. One reason is that the vegetarian diets have a lot of diversity and also they have been more affordable. So as we know, sitting in Bombay, that one of the most delicious dishes in Western India is dal gosht. So pulses will continue to remain very important, even though 
an increasing percentage of Indians is now turning non-vegetarian. So pulses will continue to be important and therefore conferences like this have a lot of relevance for policy makers. The International Food Policy Research Institute, there was a paper published by Manika Sharma and her colleagues which documented that average Indian diet has excessive consumption of cereals but the same is deficient in proteins. So against the recommended quantity of about 460 grams, uh, the rural Indians consume just about 200, which means that not only they are consuming much less quantity of proteins, but they are also consuming too much of carbohydrate. And that is why perhaps we see a lot of sugar problem in our even rural population. I was still in the ministry in Kishi Bhavan when in 2005-06 we had the food crisis and the then government went to the National Development Council which approved the National Food Security Mission in 2007. And a target was given that the production of pulses should increase by 2 million tons by 2011-12. The target was achieved which was a very good news at that time and I am happy that the new government in 2014 also continued with the National Food Security Mission for Pulses. In the first two years of the new government in 2014-15 and 15-16 as you know there was very serious drought and the pulse prices reached about 200 rupees especially 200 rupees a kilogram. So the government set up a committee under Dr. Arvind Subramanian who was the chief economic advisor he made several recommendations. We will be discussing some of these, but one of the very important recommendations was that the MSP of pulses should be increased uh, substantially. And so the government has done very well. The previous agriculture commissioner, Dr. Melotra is sitting here. The present agriculture commissioner was also here in the morning. The MSP of Tur and Urad has increased by about 54% since 2013-14. So very well done. The MSP for Moong has increased by 72%. In case of Chana, the MSP has increased by 68%. And the highest increase is in case of Masur, which is about 103%. So as a result of all these measures, coupled with several other things, but primarily because of MSP, the production has gone up from about 19 million tons in 13-14 to about 28 million tons this year. So which is a very good news and we must all feel uh, very good that the policies of the government have resulted in increase in production and therefore the need for import of pulses. Now the Subramaniam committee made several other recommendations. For example, they said that the pulses procured at MSP should be disposed of effectively because the shelf life is shorter. In the morning, uh, Deputy MD Nefed was here, Mr. S.K. Singh. He knows it very well that disposal of anything procured by the government is not easy because there are a whole lot of procedures. And so we find that from time to time, the government has found it difficult to dispose of the chana stocks. And one reason why trade does not participate in purchase of chana from the market is the large stock carried by Nefed. And even this year, uh, for some reason which I do not fully understand, the government has not allowed future trading in Chana, even though the prices have stayed below MSP for over two years. I have written several articles on the subject. And therefore, the government has decided that Chana will be given at a subsidy of 50 rupees a kilogram to the state governments because it is very difficult to dispose of. So a better policy is to allow import and export in such a manner that the prices remain above MSP so that the government does not have to procure too much of any quantity. Subramanian committee said that export of pulses should not be banned. This recommendation was accepted. Well done. They further said that state government should be advised to remove pulses from APMC Act. I think this recommendation has 
been accepted by most of these state governments in the sense that now the market fee in most of the pulse growing states is just about 1 or 2%. And my experience shows, Mr. Chaturvedi may or may not agree, that private trade will continue to buy from APMCs because creation of infrastructure similar to APMCs by private sector is not very easy. And therefore, despite the farm laws, the presence of APMCs has only strengthened and I think the government needs to further strengthen the APMCs because the main source of discovery of prices is still the APMC. So most of the pulse industry, uh, I would like to be enlightened on this point, but I think most of the pulse processing industry is still procures its, pul its pulses from the APMCs. The Subramaniam Committee also said that the government should set up a new institution for pulses, which should be owned by the government, private players and public sector. This recommendation has not been accepted, rightly so. I do not think we need more institutions in the public sector. In fact, the other day the government has announced a large number of setting up of private cooperative, of cooperatives, I think, except for some cooperatives we find that most of, the, most of them function as appendages of the government. Therefore, personally speaking, I do not think it is a very good idea to increase the presence of government because at the end of the day, they will have to be helped by budgetary means, which is not a very good idea. The committee further said, very good recommendation, Mr. Chaturvedi also spoke about it, that production of pulses must be incentivized in the irrigated areas of Punjab. This has not happened. Even though we have seen some area under mustard increasing this year in Rajasthan and Haryana, but in Punjab, for some reason, it has not happened. So we need to do much more. What needs to happen and which has not happened so far is the willingness of the government of India to bear a part of the diversification cost in Punjab. The farmers will need incentive in the form of cash. That has not been forthcoming and Punjab government is broke. Therefore, Punjab is continuing against all professional advice, including Dr. Malhotra's advice. He was agriculture commissioner, horticulture commissioner for I think about a decade, but we have not moved there. At some point of time, I, don't, I do not know when, the central government and the government of Punjab will have to work together and spend some money in incentivizing production of pulses and oil seeds in Punjab. And finally, the committee also said that the technology of genetic modification should not be shunned for pulses. In fact, pulses are still waiting for a technological breakthrough. We have seen that technological breakthrough coming in case of mustard, where a number of private companies like Corteva, etc., have brought seeds. We have seen technological breakthrough in case of maize. But somehow in case of pulses, we are still at a level of low productivity and our productivity is, is lower than even Myanmar, some 40% lower than Myanmar. In the morning, you heard the Consumer Affairs Secretary who explained in rather harsh language that the government is seized, very concerned about keeping the prices at a reasonable level. I think the government has done a good job. In fact, in, in the first two years, a price stabilization fund was set up by the government to procure any co agricultural commodity, even at a price higher than the MSP. If the government thinks that the prices are go likely to go up, the government could procure any commodity at a price higher than MSP and then sell it off in the market. Accordingly, pulses were procured and a buffer stock was created. Onions were also procured from the price stabilization fund. This year, however, the allocation for price stabilization fund has gone from 1500 crores to 1 lakh. So it is only rupees 1 lakh this year. I have not fully understood the reasons. I have written about it. I do not know. Maybe. Possibly the government is thinking that the prices will not go up this year. But I think it was a very good scheme of Modi one government in 2015-16 when price stabilization fund was set up. In the morning, Agriculture Commissioner spoke about 
you know, various steps taken to increase production. I am not going into that. But I can only say that the farmers have shown what technology can achieve. So ICRISAT and ICA are joined hands and new seeds of chana were introduced as a result of which the production of chana has now moved geographically also from North India to Central India and even South India. So we have seen technological breakthrough in case of chana but in fact it can be said that many farmers are now uh, not able to realize MSP for chana. One reason is that the future trading is banned so farmers do not have an indication of prices and the other reason is that we may be producing a little more than what we require and therefore there may perhaps be a case for persuading farmers to move from chana to masoor. So maybe Dr. Malhotra in his session will so throw some light on this. And lastly, Niti Ayog has projected that by 2030 our demand for pulses will be about 33 million tons. Now this will mean that our production has to rise about five by about five to six million tons over the next seven years. Now this is not going to be easy as Mr. Chaturvedi explained the crop area is not increasing. This can be possible only through productivity gains. For that we need science and we need better marketing policies which means that more stable policies of Essential Commodities Act, some assurance to the trade that es Essential Commodities Act will not come suddenly, stability in tariffs, stability in import-export regime and support to not only the growers but also to the trade so that the prices remain stable. I keep giving the example of edible oils. Mr. Chaturvedi has spent long years in that. The government has not spent a single penny in setting up the value chain of edible oils. From large storage tanks at the ports to the refining capacity to movement in the country, all parts of the country, everything has been done by the private sector. So we have to trust the private sector that it will create a value chain which will, which will keep the prices stable. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I hope I have said, said something which you find useful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hussain. May I please request to wait on stage, sir, a moment. Thank you, sir, once again for your wealth of information. I'd like to request another stalwart of the industry. Mr. Siraj Hussain, can you please, one second, sir. May I request another stalwart of the industry, Mr. Praveen Dongre, to please step up on stage. All of you know Mr. Praveen Dongre. He needs an introduction. He's been a stalwart who's heralded IPG also for a very long time and is still involved with the industry as a man who makes decisions and takes it forward. Big round of applause to both these stalwarts on stage, ladies and gentlemen. Moving on very quickly, the next presentation is about the overview of the Pulsar scenario in India. He's a gentleman who brings a great deal of uh, interaction and experience because he's been a journalist and he's been an agribusiness specialist. Uh, and uh, of course, he's been read by people all across the world. He is now also seen and uh, by people all across the world because he's now an expert also on uh, multimedia, including television. And he shares his expertise very willingly at forums like this. So we thank him very much for not only being an expert on the subject, but also in being an expert in helping us get organized. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. G. Chandrasekhar, international agribusiness specialist to the stage to share with us his views in as brief a time as possible. Thank you. I know the time is not enough for you to share so your experiences and uh, inputs, but thank you. Thank you, Elric. It's such a delight for me to be here as part of this uh, 
the Pulsus Conclave have been associated with the Conclave uh, since its inception in 2012, uh, working closely with uh, my friend Praveen Dongre and, of course, several other committee members of uh, IPGA. Uh, I'm going to very quickly flag some issues. India has, without doubt, made very substantial progress in pulses production since 2015-16, when we had four seasons of, uh, of uh, successive drought, bad monsoons, OK? And uh, that was the time uh, our import, of course, uh, escalated to five and a half to six million tons. And today, we are in a situation where production has jumped from 16 million tons to 27 million tons, according to the government of India. And our import requirement has declined to probably two to two and a half million tons. But as, uh, as uh, several speakers pointed out, including uh, Mr. Bimal Kothari, we need a long-term, stable, predictable policy, not just for the production side, but for the entire ecosystem of, uh, of, of pulses. And five objectives that I would like the policy, long-term policy to achieve would be like this. One, our first objective of the policy should be self-sufficiency or substantial self-reliance. There is no harm in importing. There's nothing wrong in importing. But our dependence on import has to be minimal, unlike, for example, edible oils, where it is very scary, it's alarming. And therefore, work towards self-sufficiency, if not substantial self-reliance, should be the first objective of the policy. The second objective of the policy should be certainly more remunerative price for the growers. For example, chickpea prices today are far less than the minimum support price. And therefore, the policy objective should be to ensure higher income for growers. Third, from the consumer perspective, improved nutrition for consumers at affordable prices. For our nutrition status, sadly, in this country, is not good. We have to admit. And therefore, pulses, as Mr. Bimal Kotari mentioned, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is the most economical vegetable protein available for a vast majority of the population. And therefore, we need to leverage our strengths in pulses production, 27 million tons, uh, to, to advance the nutrition security of this country, particularly for the vulnerable sections of the population. The next one, next objective is adequate raw material for the processing industry. After all, the processing industry will need, will need raw material, and we cannot starve the processing industry of, of raw material. And uh, the fifth one, sustained growth in sustainable ways is extremely important. We need a sustained growth in production, processing, consumption, and trade in very sustainable manner. In, a, in sustainable ways. For these five broad objectives, uh, I would like to see a policy, a written policy for the benefit of the nation uh, to pursue these five major objectives. The next point I want to uh, mention, in my view, for the government of India and for the policy makers, there are seven major issues that deserve close attention. Okay? And what are these, what are these uh, uh, challenges or issues? One, uh, that there are new challenges. Land constraint, water shortage, climate change. These are three issues. I don't want to uh, uh, go at length into uh, how to address these challenges, but we need to take on board, we need to recognize that these are newer challenges that are going to hurt <clears throat> Indian agriculture in general, and certainly uh, uh, pulses production in particular. Low yields, vertical growth is the only option available. Because as I would probably say a little later, that land available for pulses, in my view, in my view, and what I'm saying is all these are my personal views, it, the land available for pulses, pulses is reaching a saturation point, okay? And therefore, don't expect any dramatic increase in uh, acreage available for pulses going forward. Therefore, we need to, uh, we need, we can, our, our yields have to, have to rise if we have to have sustained growth in production. <clears throat> MSP, we need to actually seriously review and rework uh, the role of MSP and the effectiveness of MSP. 
what should be done to, to, uh, uh, to uh, how do we implement MSP in an effective way. I'll come to that in my, in my way forward recommendations. But these are issues that, that need our attention. Consumption. There's a massive skew in consumption. We have to recognize the, the, if, uh, the, according to the ICMR, Indians need to consume 20 kilograms of pulses per capita per year. The top 20 to 25 percent of the population probably consumes something like 25, 26, 27 kilograms. The bottom 40 percent of the population consumes less than 10 kilograms. It is that bottom 40 percent which is the most vulnerable section of the population which suffers from malnutrition and undernutrition. And therefore, we need to ensure we need to ensure that this skew in consumption pattern is addressed. We need to lift the consumption of the bottom 40% of the population. Then value addition. Of course, we all know uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, the properties of, uh, of pulses. These are protein-laden, pulse-based food, snacks, etc. I think uh, uh, these are well known. Uh, foreign trade, keep our import and export windows open, as Mr. Kotari pointed out in his uh, in his uh, uh, welcome speech, uh, we need to keep it open. We need to use tariffs. No banning of import or export, but if you have to regulate import or export, use tariffs as a mechanism uh, to, uh, to, to, to regulate export. And then you need to promote export. What are we doing? We claim to be the world's largest producer of pulses, and our pulses export is how much? 200,000 tons? Two and a half thousand tons? I thought we should be exporting at least a million tons. And it is possible. And I'll tell you how it is possible. I'll just uh, come to that very quickly in my, in my solutions. OK? Um, then dal mill modernization. Our dal mills are antiquated. There are probably four or 5,000 dal mills in our country. Antiquated machinery, poor scale economies. We need, we, th there is, we need a fund from the government for dal mill modernization. And it is possible to audit the mills and, and come up with uh, come up with uh, a modernization uh, strategy that will actually attract even foreign direct investment, in my view, in, in the pulses processing sector. For having talked about five objectives and, uh, and, and seven, uh, seven issues that deserve attention, I'm going to talk about the way forward. And I have a few points, OK? Now, as I said, I believe the area under pulses, area available for pulses, both in the Kharif season and Rabi season, is nearing a saturation point. 14 million hectares in Kharif, 16 million hectares in, in, in Rabi, so 30 or 31 million hectares. Don't expect it to become 40 million hectares in, in the next two, three, four years. Not going to happen. I think it is reaching a saturation point because of competition for acreage amongst various crops. Look at the data, government's own data, Kharif production of pulses is reaching, is stagnated is, is, is uh, stagnated at around 8.4, 8.5 million tons in the last three or four years. And in the meanwhile, our demand keeps going up. We need to recognize these. And all, my, all the data I'm quoting are from government sources. These are not my data. Okay. And then therefore, curry production is stagnating in the last three or four years. How are we going to break this jinx? This is extremely important. We need to think about it. And, uh, we need to overcome land constraints, water shortage, climate change challenges. What are we going to do? The one way in which we can address these is by infusing multiple technologies. When we talk of technology, everybody thinks biotechnology is the only technology available. Yes, it is an important technology, but there are other technologies also that needs to be uh, deployed. Information technology, biotechnology, Nuclear agriculture technology, satellite technology, nanotechnology. And of course, drones. Drone technology is something which the government of India has now accepted. And therefore, there is a policy, standard operating procedure for drones. Therefore, we need multiple technologies. Therefore, I would like to see a policy that takes, uh, into, uh, uh, takes into account infusion of multiple technologies uh, to address, uh, address, the, address the issue. And as uh, I think Siraj Bhai said, or even Atul said, we need a breakthrough in seed technology. I think that's extremely, uh, extremely important. We have to recognize that minimum support price alone cannot 
cannot increase yields or cannot create crop diversification. Okay, and therefore we need what I call MSP plus plus. This MSP plus plus is MSP is a political necessity. We have to accept it. MSP is a political necessity, but we need plus plus. What is that plus? The first plus is a robust procurement system. And uh, uh, no farmer in this country who, who, who produces pulses should be denied of the minimum support price. Ask yourself, is that the situation today? I am afraid it is not the situation today. And therefore, MSP plus, the second plus that I am talking about is a trade policy. Until 2018, early 2018, could you believe export of pulses from India was, was banned? It was banned in 2007 and it continued to remain banned in 20, until early 2018. Any ban on export of any agriculture commodity, in my view, is anti-farmer. And with fellows like me yelling on television, uh, uh, television writing commentaries in newspapers, finally the government saw reason and lifted the ban on pulses export in 2018, early 2018. But merely lifting the ban on pulses export is not enough because in previous 10 years you have lost the market. We used to have a thriving uh, a lentil export out of India uh, 15, 20 years ago. All the market was, was lost. But, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, therefore it's important that we also have a supportive trade policy if need be incentivize, incentivize uh, export. What are we doing to leverage our uh, foreign trade, uh, uh, foreign free trade agreement, FTA. Bangladesh imports 1.5 million tons of pulses. Sri Lanka imports half a million tons of pulses. How much is going from India? Hardly anything. What are we doing to leverage our FTA with these our neighbors? With with our neighbors, we are not doing anything. We need. It's important for the government of India to engage with our neighbors and and uh, uh, lobby. Uh, so that they buy our pulses, which will obviously eventually support, support the grower. That's extremely uh, important. Look at the per capita availability. According to the government, the current availability is 45 grams per day, which is, uh, which is what the Niti Aayog says. And what the WHO says, World Health Organization, we need 80 grams. Where are we? We are nowhere near 80 grams at 45 grams uh, per day nutrition. And then we have a lot of vulnerable population under uh, suffering from undernutrition and uh, malnutrition. We are way below the recommended health standards and nutritional standards. Think about it. For me, it, it, it's a very serious challenge that, uh, that, that, that we need to face. Okay, Skew in consumption. We need to address the skew in consumption. As I said, the top 25% of the population gets to consume much higher quantities of what the per capita consumption number would suggest. But actually that per capita consumption is a wrong terminology. It is per capita availability. Per capita consumption is higher at the higher income, the, uh, income levels and very low uh, at, at, at the lower income levels. We need to, we need to address this skew and lift the consumption of the bottom 30% uh, of the population. And to do that, to address this queue, I would strongly recommend that we need to supply pulses through the public, through all the welfare programs, uh, public distribution system, uh, ICDS, midday meal scheme, national food security mission, etc. Use all the welfare programs to promote, uh, promote uh, pulses consumption. This is ex extremely important because that will also improve the marketability of the crop by by, 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 the, by the farmers, okay, that, that's, and advance our nutrition security. We are a nation that eats dal chawal or dal roti. And therefore, dal comes first, uh, wheat and bread or, or, or chawal, which is rice, then comes next. Therefore, dal roti, dal chawal is extremely important. When the government of India supplies rice and wheat free of cost to a uh, very substantial uh, uh, portion of the population, uh, it, it actually uh, ensures uh, that they get to eat rice and wheat. Demand for pulses, pulses do not have a standalone demand. Demand for pulses is supplementary to the consumption of wheat and rice. And, and therefore, it is important that when you supply free uh, rice and wheat, 
uh, under welfare programs also include pulses, which will, which will have multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, benefits for the nation. Uh, and uh, promote export through incentives, leverage our FTAs. And I would, I would think, lastly, all government decisions, interventions should be data-driven. And with, with due respect to everybody, I suspect there is not enough data that is collected, collated, or properly interpreted. And I'm happy to say this in public. Okay, thank you very much. Good luck. God bless you all. Thank you. Mr. Chandrasekhar, please, one moment, sir. May I please request Satya Chupadhyay to please step up on stage and present Mr. Chandrasekhar with the mentor for being here with us. Thank you for sharing uh, your views, sir. And most strongly expressed, I must say, I do hope the, that they are taken in the spirit that you have said so that we do improve. Thank you once again, sir. A small mentor, thank you, sir, for being here. Very, very special member of the Executive Committee right here at IPGA. Mr. Satya Chupadhyay doing us the honors.